I'm thrilled to have uh, Dawn Henderson as our uh, guest uh, for this conversation. She's the um, Program Director of Research and Evaluation at the Duke Center for Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation, and the co-director of the Collective Health Education Equity Research Collaborative in North Carolina. She began thinking like a community psychologist when she and her fellow students in the Student Government Association organized a walkout against the Board of Education's removal of the principal in her high school. However, her formal and doctoral training in community psychology began in North Carolina State University's Applied Community and Psych in uh, social and community psychology program. Since then, she's been on a journey to increase her knowledge and practice of community-based research, working across school districts and nonprofit organizations to strengthen university community relationships. She's an interdisciplinary research fellow with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I'm honored to be a consultant and accompany her on her journey in that uh, leadership fellowship uh, area. Um, I'm very excited to hear what Dawn has to say, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Well, thank you so much, um, Tom. Uh, yes, this, this invitation really um, stemmed from Tom being, he said consultant. I, I think, Tom, you are coach and mentor, um, and he has been that for the past three years. Um, in my fellowship with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So I am just, um, just want to say good afternoon to everyone. And I do want to uh, take a pause and just acknowledge that um, I struggled being here um, this, this afternoon, um, but I am mostly present in this space because I have kind of learned how to numb the rage the anger and the pain that I have felt and, and have sort of uh, existed in, in terms of this place that I call anti-Blackness. So I ask that you all have some degree of grace um, in terms of uh, being here and being present with me um, this morning or actually mid-afternoon, as I say. So I wanna first and make sure that everybody can see the slide. Um, can everyone see that? I've had some good days and bad days with presenting on Zoom. So I just want to make sure you all good. can see that. Good. So again, you know, I enter this space as someone who self-identifies as a community psychologist. I like to say that I have been mostly an academic, partially a practitioner. Um, but as someone who has spent a significant portion of my life, um, dedicated to asking permission from darker skin bodies, black and brown bodies, mostly young people and older at times to write about their stories, right? To write about their stories through my research, right? And I acknowledge that most of their stories are about their resistance and healing amid the system of racism. I also acknowledge that as a community psychologist that I have received an indoctrination of what I call hierarchies, right? That as much as I attempt to embrace community members in my work, as much as I have attempted to work alongside community members, that I too have inherited this idea of a hierarchy of value, right? And that is partially from navigating historically white institutions and being indoctrinated by methodologies that often grants me privileges and power, right? Power to construct, to deconstruct, and reconstruct narratives of human existence. So the title of my presentation is really partly about that journey, right? So what I call is in search of community-based research and the racism I found. I do wanna let you know that when I was thinking about the title, I struggled with what it could be, right? It's not like I found racism, but um, we'll talk a little bit more about this title a little bit later as I open up um, this space. I do wanna also let you know that I provided throughout this presentation an opportunity for us to pause and reflect on the content that I shared 
Um, and so I'm asking you all to open up and to be willing to engage with me, right? If you have specific questions that you have um, about my presentation, I'm gonna ask that you hold those off until the end of my presentation and we'll have some dialogue around that. So just for me, I want to honor what I call just like a, a mental moment. I'm gonna ask you all to just give me one word that describes how you are feeling in this moment. And you are welcome to unmute um, yourself and speak it out loud, or you can put it in the chat. It's up to you. Encourage. Thank you. Reflexive. Angry. I hear, I see underwater, activated, angry, committed, energized, anxious, energized. Relieved. Relieved. Concerned. So again, um, it's good to know that how you are feeling in the moment is across the spectrum. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that and also know that I share the sense of, of relief because I'm here. Um, I share, share a sense of nervousness because I'm presenting in front of my peers and a sense of anxiousness because there's always just a lot happening in, in our lives on an everyday basis. Um, so what I hope to, you know, I just kind of structure my goals, not from like learning outcomes or objectives, but I would like to say what I'm hoping that this digital space can create, right? I hope that in this digital space, in this hour that we have together, that we can foster the sense of openness, right? That you feel open and are open to the ideas that I may express. I also acknowledge that some of the ideas that I may express may require you to feel some sense of discomfort or dissonance. And I only ask that you engage with that feeling, right? So be open to learning and discovery. Um, I ask that you are and you're committed to. So I hope that the goal that we foster engagement in this space and create an opportunity for us to learn from each other. And more importantly, and I must say I'm a little bit biased in terms of this perspective, I hope that some of you do walk away and you feel like you've upped your practice game in to that regard. So I wanna first start off with um, racism. And again, you know, I think about the title of my presentation, the challenge of, or at least I found the challenge of our work is often our inability to name what it is. Sometimes we like to, uh, I say, skirt around the issue. We like to code language so that we don't necessarily make people feel uncomfortable or whatever. But for me, um, again, we think about like semantics, you know, we want to think about the relationship between words and try to draw different meanings, but words are powerful and they convey something that that is meaningful to me. And so I want to say that this presentation is about naming racism. Um, and I see racism as this kind of interconnected, complex system. And from my perspective, it is a system that reifies, reinforces, maintains, and sustains a hierarchy of human value based on this erroneous construct that we have in our existence called race. I purposely do not use white supremacy. I do not support, nor do I believe, that white folks are superior to any other group of people. So you will not hear me use that language today. Um, I also acknowledge that um, folks have used terms like racial discrimination, implicit bias, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so again, I think that oftentimes these terms aim to minimize the reality of racism, both as an overt and pervasive nature of racism, as well as the insidious nature of racism, right? So again, I am using racism in this term. So just quickly, 
Um, many of you, I would like to hear from you. Um, how often do you really get the, the opportunity to answer the question in your work, right? How is racism playing out here in my work and research? Like you can say not often, not at all. Again, I'm asking you to, you know, unmute yourself and say, oh, quite often or every day. But I want it to be an honest response. Like think about your work, think about your research right now. And are you specifically answering the question, how is racism playing out here in my work? So this is what I call a pause and reflection moment. Let's take a pause. Let's reflect. Every single day, daily. The partners, yes. Every day. Regularly. Often. Daily. Well, interesting enough, um, I would like to argue that although it is part of what I have embodied, due to my experience here in the United States, I will say that in my work, I haven't in a very intentional way been able to answer that question. In fact, I would argue that it kind of uh, seeps into the work that I have done. And so for me, again, this presentation is it needs to be explicit and upfront, right? And so I'm going to just share with you all like my perspective of how I think that racism plays out, particularly when we think about our everyday work. So as a community psychologist, again, I think we, again, we frame things from this kind of ecological complex system, right? And so it's important for us to think of racism as this interconnected and highly complex system. And when I think about this system, to me, what is at the very foundation of the system, again, is the belief in racial hierarchies, right? That the belief that this hierarchy of human value, the notion of value is based on race. And I like to argue that this very notion, this very belief in human value is what undergirds every interaction in our social system, it influences our schemas. It has a lot to do with our everyday interpersonal interactions that we are having, right? And so again, this hierarchy has created these arbitrary characteristics that are associated with skin, the complexion of one's skin, where lighter skinned individuals, those perceived as having characteristics closer to this idea of whiteness are superior, Whereas all others, those whose skin is closer to what I call blackness, are inferior. It is this very belief that undergoes every aspect of our social institutions. The symbols that we see represented in our social institutions and the ways in which, again, this manifests across what we call policies in our institutions. So we can go back to Jim Crow laws, but we can also think about the implications of colorblind policies, like the idea of zero tolerance being a quote unquote colorblind policy, but having serious and harmful implications on the well being of black and brown children, right? We can think of this in a very symbolic way. So, and help me get through this, um, this particular piece, but we can think about this how symbolically the ways in which we devalue black women and the symbol of the black woman, and think about more recently Breonna Taylor and how. In the report, no one could even name her name in when they were thinking about the implications of who they would charge in her case. 
that her name was still not uttered in that. And so this idea that somehow this body is even invisible in terms of how we construct our reality, right? We can think about symbolically how even our organization, SCRA, when we think about who gets to claim community psychology, where even 30 institutions or over 30 institutions that have listed or are cited as having community psychology programs, then not one of those institutions represents a historically Black college or university. So symbolically, we have to think about the ways in which the system is permeating every aspect of our existence, right? And then of course, again, at the individual level, how we may manifest this in both implicit and explicit ways, right? And act on these beliefs. And sometimes we act on them by a deep awareness and sometimes we are unaware, right? Even how many of us have internalized racism, right? And internalized it in ways where we believe that our bodies have less value, that we are somehow imposters when we enter into space is where we do not see many people who look like us or where we see people orient themselves different from us, right? Where somehow I must be an imposter, not an authentic being in this place, right? We also see the ways in which this can manifest, these, these beliefs and an idea of human value can manifest in how we think about our interpersonal relationships or interpersonal interactions, right? So again, when you think about that accordingly, you know, Black African Americans are more likely to be referred for an amputation when you compare them to white. Um, clients, right? We're more likely, or excuse me, less likely um, Latinx patients can come in for bone fractures and will be um, less likely to be referred or receive pain medication when compared to their whites. So we have to think about, again, the ways in which these beliefs permeate how we may evaluate others and the ways in which we evaluate communities, the ways in which we evaluate other people. So here I created what I call a table. So if we understand this complex system of racism, then we understand the social cultural constraints that arises, right? So again, if we frame our work from understanding this complex interconnected system, it can help us to understand these social cultural constraints that are impacting communities that we are a part of. So I like to say, again, we can see this manifest symbolically. So this idea that if it's majority Black, then somehow it must need something, that somehow these people are inferior or they need folks to come in and save them because Black parents just don't know how to parent right or black children or Latinx or brown children just don't know how to act right, right? So that idea and the ways in which it plays out symbolically, we think about the ways in which we see this play out in institutional structures. So in unequitable funding, right? In highly segregated neighborhoods and the stresses that are associated with highly segregated neighborhoods of folks who don't have access to good quality health services or access to the necessary foods and nutrients that they need to live and thrive, right? We think about, again, this complex system of racism perpetuating the idea of competition over communalism. So oftentimes, again, these institutional policies that we only gonna allot this amount of money for this community and not necessarily provide that same amount of money for this community because we want to do an experiment, right? We want to see if we, do, you know, provide this here and we don't provide it there, the way, you know, what are the effects of some kind of intervention, right? And how that permeates the work that we do. We also have to take into consideration that, excuse me, oops, sorry, y'all. 
the distrust that arises, right? When you're talking about being um, exploited, right? When folks only come knocking on your door because we just received this funds, you know, from this agency. We thought it would be nice to come <laughs> and work with you as a community, right? And the tension that's often associated with that historical relationship between community and universities. And also we think about, again, these social cultural constraints. So the ways in which people begin to feel they do not have power to change the system, right? So when they feel that, that we have this sense of powerlessness that can emerge, this internalization of, of feeling like I do not matter. And also what I like to say when you've been advocating for meaning and value in a system for so long, you just get battle fatigue. So then as researchers, we're like, well, I don't know why this person, they're not coming to this event. We have to take all of these things into consideration when we're doing our work. So I wanted to just take a pause. And again, when I think about this concept of community-based participatory research, we understand quite broadly, according to the literature, that it is about building relationships, right? That somehow, to some degree, we are working with community partners, community members, we are developing these reciprocal relationships across and between individuals, and we are using community voice to help us identify what tends to be relevant phenomenon or a issue or challenge that they are interested in and working within communities to help them identify the strategies or the solutions to those particular challenges or issues. So this is not again a class on CBPR, just wanted to kind of reframe us in that. And thinking about the slides that I just presented, um, we're going to do a pause and reflection again. And what are some social cultural constraints that you instantly recognize when you think about the CBPR work? And even your work, if you have done community-based, community-engaged research. I'll jump in if that's okay, Don. Do you want us to put in the chat or just talk? Yes, talk out loud, okay. yes, as a part. <laughs> um, as a practitioner, so I don't do research, but as someone who gets grant funding, a lot of the, that sort of baseline like relationship work that we like to do to create relationships in the community and have these conversations is not considered direct service. And so I have to balance needing to meet my direct service requirements of you know 600 hours a year, but a lot of the things that we have to do that I want to do to like create these community relationships and really have these, you know, these dialogues and start having conversations about how we can create a community. Those hours and that work isn't considered like direct service by my funders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would jump in and say, speaking of funders, oftentimes I have a rotation of funders who come in and want to hear from certain communities that I just simply don't belong to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, um, it's challenging to get a contract and then have to build a relationship within the constraints of that contract. And it's, you know, it feels disingenuous to, to try and, and do a CBPR type of project in that, in that context. Mm -hmm. I think that for all the reasons you just laid out in the ways that the systems of racism operate at various levels, there are all those things that have come before me and that I have been a part of either inadvertently, hopefully, or, um, or by not being as careful. And so why would people want to do this work? It interrupts the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Just to use our, our best practices may not be the community or an individual's best practices. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is Kyra. I think similarly, um, maybe Nicole said it. Um, I think through my experience working as a practitioner evaluation, um, there was always that kind of restraint and 
difference in value system of um, engaging in participatory evaluative work. Um, and now that I'm at, you know, in an academic setting, um, one of the, the constant battles of dealing with systems of racism and its sucklings, um, whether that manifests in, um, you know, just other ways is just the, the, the administrative burden of like having to deal with the bureaucracy of things that don't always fit um, the value system of working participatory or you know, in an empowering way with mm -hmm. community members. And so it's, it's, it can be quite frustrating um, when those value systems that are rooted in racism, um, sh you know, manifest in various different ways. Hi, uh, this is Anne Marie. Um, I know, Dawn, that you spoke about um, not invoking the ideology of white supremacy, but I find that uh, a barrier to doing a CBR for me is what knowledge is considered to be um, valued. What knowledge, you know, can we write about? What stories can we share? And I believe that speaks to white supremacy and just in a way of what's considered to be superior and what's considered to be inferior. So it's definitely a constraint within the academy um, in trying to promote and say, hey, you know what? Our communities, our people, we know stuff and it's very valuable. Our knowledge is valuable, just as valuable as anybody else's knowledge. So uh, it's just in sharing that, uh, that's definitely something that we come up against on a regular basis. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you, Emery. Did anyone else um, have anything to share in, in terms of this work? I would just say that the majority of the time that someone says they're doing CBPR work, they're not really talking to the people most affected by the issue, which is what I would mean by community. They're talking mm -hmm. to agencies, they're talking to mid-level organizations, but um, we don't know how to get to them. We don't know how to talk to them. And we've done it wrong for so many generations that we just settle for all kinds of other compromised positions. And it's uh, terrifying to see it called CBPR. Mm -hmm. Tom, I have a solution for that, but it's close to the end, okay? <laughs> of even, even us pushing back on the term CBPR. Um, any, any other folks wanted to just pause and reflect out loud in terms of other, um, the ways in which you see this um, instantly recognized in, in your own work? All right. So again, it, this is about interrogating um, racism, right? And thinking about the ways in which um, it leads to these social cultural constraints that, that show up, that arises when we are working with communities. And um, our lack thereof in terms of knowledge about how does this particular framing um, influence our work and ways and how do we even think about how we respond to the ways in which we think about racism and its permeance in, in our particular work. So as the, um, as the advertisement alluded to, I wanted to give you all like a case study. Um, again, you know, we're all trying to figure out this Zoom environment. So ideally you probably would have had this before, but um, this is kind of reflecting on um, the project that I alluded to with the Robert Wood um, Johnson Foundation. And so I'm just gonna read out a summary of, of an overall, just a description of the project, okay? So again, this is Charter School A. Um, it had a student population that was roughly about 95% of those who self-identified as Black African American. And we were attempting to initiate what I call a violence prevention intervention designed by a group of researchers to reduce suspensions and discipline referrals. So in the design, we really focused on improving how teachers and parents conflict de-escalation, right? And effective 
communication strategies. Um, the goal was that teachers would implement these strategies in the classroom, parents would begin implementing these strategies at home, and ultimately what we were hoping to do is what we call transforming the psychosocial environment of the students, right, by focusing on the adult relationships in their life. So again, our model was that if we improve adult um, how adults model these strategies, then ultimately the children or the students themselves will begin to model similar strategies. So I would like to challenge you all and please, again, this is like a reflect out loud, identify areas in there that you think are concerned or already you can see there may be some constraints in terms of how we are doing this work. So I'll go ahead and jump in. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So I'm automatically noticing that it seems to be assuming that the parents are engaging in poor communication and have like escalating conflicts going on in their home spheres, which frankly is a little insulting. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking about like if this, if I was a parent, I would be like, what are you implying about my home environment by thinking I need to, you know, learn different strategies of communication. Excellent. Thank you. I can go next. Um, I would say also that we already know that there's racism in terms of disciplinary referral systems. And so that's one level of analysis. And then this intervention is designed to essentially change the students. So it's the wrong level of analysis, um, which then takes on a deficit narrative. So then the intervention is also racist. Thank you. That was Regina, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Other people. Dive in. I think just so this is something that um, we talk about a lot in the maternal child health field where you start looking at um, like home visitation, but this idea of colonizing spaces um, with this idea that if we go in and we change these things um, that maybe fit within this particular ideology, which is um, rooted in racism, rooted in white supremacy, um, you know, and kind of being the bearers of knowledge to um, make these changes with this group. And so that's something that, you know, I see standing out overall and very consistent with the, the type of work that um, I'm engaged in. Mm -hmm. Very good. Other people's thoughts? I typed it in the chat, but the intervention was designed by people not living this life. It so seems highly problematic. Like, how do you know how to intervene with someone who hasn't actually had the opportunity to talk about what they need? Mm -hmm. Exactly. They didn't ask. They just didn't ask. I mean, that's like CP 101. Ask yeah. what community needs before you design projects. Mm -hmm. I, would, oh. I, I would also add that, you know, something that we think about a lot in our lab is how um, more individual or interpersonal interventions are, um, you know, maybe they're band-aids and maybe they're necessary band-aids if they adhere to community needs. But, um, you know, it also, we, we get stuck there and we don't think about kind of structural factors that, ha that are constraining and disenfranchising communities actively. And so mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, I, we've tried to incorporate kind of more structural level uh, interventions or system level interventions as well, so that we're not explicitly or implicitly putting the blame on these communities or the burden on these communities to address problems that um, they did not create. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. And, and I'm just gonna say yes. Something, something I was reminded of in um, uh, my American Sign Language class and group, um, which has been a really great um, experience because I got to see another highly marginalized group 
and how um, for many people in the hearing concern world, it's like they don't even exist, right? So a lot of things that are going on are timely and those, um, you know, uh, news reports and, and scientific uh, reports and, and things that are needed to be disseminated to the public quickly and they're completely excluded because there's no interpreters or there's not, you know, <laughs> act digital access. So the saying that I've heard going around is um, no decisions about us without us. And it's not a new saying, but it had a new reflection looking at a world where we need instant information right now because of the uncertainty. And there's a whole community of people who have um, a concern and, are, and they're not even being addressed. So no decisions about us without us. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other thoughts or insights from here? So um, I, again, uh, I want to thank you all. Um, so the orange for me is like where, where it all went wrong, right? And so I do want to just explain a little bit in um, about just charter schools. I don't know whether you're a proponent or not, but we do know here in the state of North Carolina, um, the charter school laws, the legislation around charter school laws were to foster this idea of privatizing education, but using public funds, right? And so collectively, the idea was that we wanted to you know, legislation has argued that we want to foster competition because we believe that through competition, the public education system quite broadly will improve itself, like that self-regulatory, you know, process. They will just improve quite naturally. Unfortunately, again, not surprising in North Carolina, although there have been over 200 charter schools in operation, these schools have remained highly segregated across race, ethnicity, it's concept of race, ethnicity, and class lines. And they are finding that charter schools are more segregated than public schools. Another thing we also want to note that in the state of North Carolina, that those schools that predominantly serve students who have been eligible for free and reduced lunch, as I stated, are held up to the same academic performance metrics, but overwhelmingly do not meet these performance standards. So, um, and again, there is no extra money that comes with um, serving students who may not necessarily have the economic resources um, to support their education. So I think that there's, again, the issue of charter schools and how they function and operate in the state of North Carolina. I also want to um, make note that in the state of North Carolina, I don't know if this is like other states, but churches can actually come in and rent space to charter schools. So what technically happens is that churches are benefiting from public dollars by um, allowing quote unquote charter schools to operate and function within their buildings. And um, as you know, if I can talk about this particular case study, that was problematic for the school at the time because the church not only was receiving quite a few, uh, a significant portion of funds to, to rent space, but they also only allocated a certain amount of space for the school itself, which was highly limiting in terms of where students could go, where they could you know, move around the classroom. Again, as you all recognize that there's a problem in the fact that this was designed by a group of researchers. The concept of reducing suspension and discipline referrals, as Regina already noted, and many of you already know, that every since, actually since 1972, that there has been a disproportionate number of black and brown students suspended. So again, the school to prison pipeline may be new language, but this has permeated our public education system for forever. And we also note that those suspensions are not necessarily about quote unquote violent related behaviors, that those behaviors are often very subjective, right? Something for insubordination, disrespect, excessive noise, dress code violations. The other thing, as you all alluded to, oh, <laughs> like, like folks don't know how to communicate, so let us go in and help. 
um, these teachers and parents learn these strategies, right? That somehow also is problematic that we believe that teachers will begin to use this back in their classrooms, parents in their homes, that somehow we were transforming the psychosocial environment and all of these sort of problems that we began to identify along the way. I think somebody had another comment. Yes. So just moving forward, again, going back to um, this complex and interconnected system, as I talked about, um, again, social cultural constraints, problematic researcher driven, um, what we found again, that distrust, intention and communication, there wasn't a problem with individuals communication, it is just that there is a history, and you all um, may or may not note this, but again, if you think about the ways in which um, black and brown bodies have been introduced to the public education system, we can recognize and acknowledge that black parents, brown parents have always had to advocate for their children to be treated fairly, um, to be included and not excluded. And so again, if you talk about the ways in which we embody racism, you can understand the tension and the stress that happens the moment I have to step into this setting, right? That I'm bringing this history with me. And at times, again, the ways in which you may perceive my communication may not necessarily be aligned to the ideals of how people are supposed to behave and perform, but it's not necessarily something about me. It's a challenge that we have to have to the system. And as I talked about too, excuse me, the battle fatigue. So even in ourselves, as we were doing this project, wondering where are our parents? You know, we're providing these incentives. We're offering them dinner, we're doing these things. But again, when you're talking about a life history of this process, the fatigue sets in. And so being invited to be a part of another research project, there's no desire to do that if that is not benefiting and improving your overall well-being in life. Sorry about that, you guys got a little bit of background noise. So for me, I would like to say that I have had to challenge myself as a community psychologist and also as a researcher, as a Black woman, and thinking about the ways in which I have been... Hold on, I'm sorry, you guys. Sorry, <laughs> this is real. <laughs> Um, so I, as a community psychologist, have been cognizant of the ways in which I have been complicit, right? And how do I advocate against the system? And for me, I want to thrive. And I want the people that I'm working with and on behalf to be able to live and to achieve their best life, right? I want darker skinned people to be able to embrace all of their humanity and not worry about being policed, discarded, devalued, disregarded, or whatever. And part of that is talking about reframing this concept of what I call community-based research, <laughs> participatory research, thank you, and. And so I would like to say that my journey is starting to bring forward what I call thinking through this differently using what I call a racial healing lens. Um, and not to really go forward into the TRHT framework, but I do want to introduce this framework that was um, designed by Dr. Gail Christopher. She was a part of the um, Kellogg Foundation. But a critical piece of our work has to be how are we dismantling these systems of separation, right? How are we beginning to dismantle the, these economic and legislative and judicial constraints that are allowing people, not allowing people to truly thrive? And again, if we're talking about immersing ourselves and building relationships in the community, then our framing and our lens has to be about that. And how do we reimagine a different future for ourselves as researchers, but also for, as practitioners, but also our community? So if I could bring forth some new language, I would like to say that part of this is pushing back on the term itself, 
community-based participatory research. And oftentimes we can fall down the abyss. And as we attempt to climb, we get inundated in history and how, how history has formalized language in ways where we continue to feel pressured to continue to use the same language. And I would say we have to put forth new terminology, right? That yes, we have to change this idea that me as researcher is being placed in the community and how this placement is often momentary, right? And it's never necessarily sustained. And for me as a researcher, that placement in that community space is usually associated with some grant or a need to produce some intellectual commodity um, that most community folk do not access, nor do they read. So in just ending this presentation, before I open it up for a discussion, I thought about just throwing these two terms out. And this is what I call community-powered participatory research, or maybe reframing this from community driven, because to me, this is pushing back against the system that has more often um, disempowered people. And more often, we ourselves have to operate within that. So how do we as researchers push back against that system? So we're thinking in new and innovative um, ways. So I wanna again, thank you all. I do want to put a little shout out. If you are on Twitter, um, this is my Twitter handle, Professor X on. Um, I do want to acknowledge the fact that um, Cheer is a collaborative, so we're not like an official organization. We are individuals who invite folks who are interested in promoting health and education equity. Um, as I alluded to uh, before, you know, in terms of transforming and dismantling belief structures, we have to think about narrative and how narrative can oftentimes weave and, and influence our belief structures and influence our schemas. So I like to say we have to also change um, the narrative. Um, and so I'll give you guys, and I can come back to that slide. So just as much as the way I started um, and before I open up this space for questions, I want you to share just one word that describes what you will take away from this moment. Um, and it's okay if it's like still contemplating too. You can share it out loud or share it in the space. I'm gonna say agreement. Thank you. So I see empowered leadership, activated, thank you, awareness, thank you. empowering. Awesome. Hopeful. So Tom, hopefully my timing was great. I want to open up the floor for um, questions and maybe just some cross dialogue that we can have in the last few minutes of our time together. Beautiful. And maybe you want to open the screen up so we can see everybody for the discussion. Yes. That'd be great. How are we doing? Perfect. Um, Don, I'll start. I, I, I want to thank you for this um, because I really believe that narratives drive our world. If I didn't hear everyone's personal stories, I would not have a better framework for how this world operates. And I am 100% supportive of, uh, you know, side by side with you on the language. We have to change the language. And we have, you know, we have to be willing to understand it. And we definitely have to change the language and change the way, change it from a failure-based mentality to strength-based and empowerment-based. Because 
our whole, in fact, we're finding out as America crumbles before our eyes that I believe the chief um, issue is just, you know, this, this um, failure-based concept of, you know, American exceptionalism, but really it equals failure-based where our society is designed for us not to succeed. And I think that's the thing that's most uncomfortable for people as we're finding that out. I know it's been devastating for me to realize that all this time it's been like a lie. And I think that admitting that and acknowledging that, you know, sharing our narratives and then changing the language going forward to empowering language for everyone and not, you know, flattening these hierarchies and really learning collaboration. So, mm -hmm. so thank you again. This has been really um, empowering today. Well, I want to say thank you, um, Vernita. Um, you are someone that I was telling Tom, I said, where did she come from? <laughs> so first of all, just hearing, uh, hearing that from you, I appreciate, I appreciate that insight and, and your perspective, and I value that. So thank you so much. Are there other questions or thoughts people would like to share in this moment? I love being here at the launching of the phrase community powered participatory research because I hated the other. And I think that's a great uh, addition. And um, I would, what I don't think comes across, but I was there for the, the nitty gritty battles. And I must say that I share a role of, of uh, consultant with uh, Norita Wilbur Milburn, and so the two of us were coaching uh, Dawn through this. Is It was, a, you know, here is an, a brand new starting up, uh, mainly African-American, small two-grade uh, school in North Carolina. You think, what a good opportunity. And then you get in there, and part of what the, the team brought with it, but part of what it then faced, you talked about how the church rented space. I, that, that's the piece of, that blows my mind. They were getting $32,000 a month to rent the space. That's $400,000 a year. It was set up by the North Carolina legislature to fund churches. Had nothing to do with schools, but you don't know that. I mean, we didn't really discover that. Dawn didn't really discover that until a couple of years into it. So, I mean, that's why I like the title so much. You mm -hmm. sort of walk in. And then you find the racism in the system only as you stumble along. And it stumbled along because we got to year two and they were adding grades and they weren't adding space. And so you had to ask, where's the space? You know, well, we have $400,000, we can't give you more space. I mean, mm -hmm. so it, it was an incredible journey, journey and I love the way you presented it today. Well, thank you, Tom. I could not have survived. You know, this is so important about the village of community psychologists, and we have to remind ourselves of the power of our village um, and having like very frank and honest conversations with each other because our village has to be strong. This work, however you come into this work, it is, it is about transformation. I truly, I am biased. I acknowledge that, but the framing that we collectively have is about transformation. And so I just want to say that I could not have survived <laughs> this pro, this three years of this fellowship because it was difficult. And I don't know if anybody has ever received funding through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation too. And that was problematic and contentious as well. And then you're doing this work and you have three years, right, to do this work. And so um, between Tom and Norita and me reaching out and being open to having them as part of my village was critical to how I navigated and survived um, this project and this work and even my personal insights and wisdom. And as I said, this is a journey. I am continuing to learn more about what this work looks and feels like when we are not in our university settings. And so I just want to acknowledge that. What happened to the school and the project in the end? Well, <laughs> and we're hoping that it doesn't end. We are, um, 
Right now, like everyone, COVID-19, you know what I mean? We were doing the work, we were in the school and then um, COVID-19 happened. And so the school had to prioritize just basics, right? How do they make sure that their teachers are being able to respond? And this is mostly kindergarten through third graders. So a lot of our work was kind of secondary, to be quite honest with you. And although they have expressed an interest to continue, they are just right now just trying to make sure that they are meet, meeting the needs of their students. Um, I do know that they were in the process of transitioning away from the church, but I think they're still in negotiation in terms of finalizing that. So. Um, like everyone, you know, COVID-19 has a significant impact on how we engage um, communities and with communities. Yes. I wonder, Don, were you able to intervene on this intervention? And if so, how did you do that? And what did it look like? And how did it go? Oh, yes. We, so one of the terms, if you guys want another term, I said that we would need to push back on best practices and call them adaptable practices because we had to adopt our intervention. To be quite honest with you, Regina, the concept of fidelity, we had to throw that out the door. And what we decided to do, we started to just cultivate a space where parents could just come in and have dialogue and talk through some of the challenges that they were experiencing at the school mostly. At times we did have administrators and some of the teachers there, but we just found the empowering piece for ourselves was how important space, like space to process through the harm and space for people to recognize that I have a voice, that I am invested in my children's um, education. And, and another thing I do want to say is that we found with the parents that we were working with, these parents started showing up at the board meetings and they were lighting fire underneath the board. And we were like, yes. And it created a lot of tension and conflict. But I remember one parent said, you all need structured dialogue that's the problem and that was the, the <laughs> intervention that we used so I think again you know I'm, I'm embracing adaptable practices particularly when you're finding that you're giving people um all you're doing is really creating pathways because they already had excuse me, had voice, you're just opening up a pathway for them to say, you are not going to do this to my child and I'm going to stand behind this and all of that. So that was probably what we found the most enlightening in our project, to be honest, Regina, and how we had to adapt this concept of our intervention. Yes. And you can hear how effective it was. It was amazing. All right. Well, Dawn, Enormous gratitude. This was a, just a, the work is beautiful. I've known that, but the presentation and engaging everybody in the discussion was brilliant. So I really appreciate it. I thank you. I'm sure we all do. And uh, just a quick announcement that next month on October 23rd, uh, Vinita Perkins, who is with us, is going to talk about uh, becoming community uh, with, a, a, an, with an applied community psychologist. So uh, that'll be the, the topic then. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, a, a round of applause. I, I love that. Thank you. And for those folks who want to stay in touch, I, I gave you my institution email address um, as well as my Gmail address. And Tom, if you want, you know, you can send out my email to, to everybody who was on the space or whatever. I have no problem with that. This has been recorded and Gina will place it on the, the website Wonderful. that you always put uh, in. Uh, with the announcements and yes. uh, hope you pass it on to other people. Yes. And, and just because, you know, I've been doing this. So I just want to very, everybody could just take like this journey. I've been calling it bringing energy forward. So it's like one, two, three, and then we clap and then we spread it out. Um, I actually learned this by from Quasi Brookins. He's a community psychologist too. And so if you all don't mind, we're just going to go one, two, three, and let's just spread some good energy because we all need, need it right now, okay? All right, here we go. One, two, three, and forward. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, have Blessings. a wonderful day. Blessings. Bye -bye. Thank you, Don. Well, Alan.